going to go ahead and get started. So everybody can come in, find their seat. Looks like we got a lot of seats. I got the luck of following Justin today. So everybody thank Justin. That was an awesome job at his last talk there. All right, so proof of possession. Justin was right. A lot of attention has been paid on proof of possession. Um, so my name is Michael Langen. I'm a principal engineer with T-Mobile. I'm also the lead architect on the project Verify we'll be talking about on Friday. So come see me if you want to talk more about that. Um, T-Mobile has been on a path for the last three years trying to get binding into our infrastructure. So I am not presenting the standard. I have some references to the standard. I have some references to what we've done. I have some references to best practices. Um, hence why this is a little bit of bake your own. There's some guidance for what we've found, and um, I capture what I think are some lessons learned. So I'm going to walk you through what's wrong with bearer tokens. Um, a basic proof of possession example for those that aren't familiar with it yet, that haven't attended in any of these sessions. Um, I'm going to cover some binding options that have been looked at. Um, and then I'm going to get into a little subtlety around client instances and the difference between um, a singular client versus client instances and how that impacts a binding flow. And really, those two are really tied together. Um, and then I'll get into the DPOP spec. OK, so what's wrong with your bearer token? You've spent years investing in an IDP. You are issuing tokens. You've finally gotten your developers to stop doing passwords. Right, and I'm telling you it's broken because bearer tokens are like car keys, right? All right, my car key works, but you can lose it, it can get copied, it can be replayed. So not the best of security post-authentication, right? So a bearer token is much more like a passport. I could try to use my wife's passport. She has a whole lot more hair than I do, so it's not gonna work so while going through TSA. Right? And so a Bound token contains enough signals that you can prove that the client that was given the token is the only client using the token. And it's not just about an authentication time. It's with, it, with every API request. So a lot of people will federate an IDP, let you log in with Google, and then convert it to their own services SSO session token, right? And so you need to put those bindings down into the tokens you're using for every API request. OK, so basic example of token binding. You are a client. You have a public and private key pair. I'm not going to bother going through all the uh, specifics of how public and private key pairs. I assume you guys are capable of following that. Um, a request to get a token, you provide your credentials as well as your public key, and that public key now is getting wrapped into the token that's issued, right? So the token issued contains your key. So now when you go to talk to your API server, you present both the access token you were issued as well as you calculate your own signature, right? So using your private key, you're going to be able to calculate a signature and add them both. So the resource server is receiving two objects to authenticate this request. And so first off, authenticates the token is from an IDP he trusts. The IDP is telling him explicitly whether or not this is an introspection response or coming back within the token payload itself. Um, it uses the same algorithm to process the signature, validates the signature, and honors the request, serves up the API. Right? And so clearly, there's a lot more overhead when you're choosing this approach. Um, but this is entirely appropriate when you're talking about modifying user data. Um, OK. So proof of possession options. There's been a lot of work done in the last several years. I know Brian Campbell, I think I saw him on a camera around here, um, did a bunch of work on TLS token binding, using the key of the TLS tunnel itself as a form of the proof that the client is in possession. So you would issue the token to the public key of the TLS tunnel. Um, one of the reasons why TLS was so, such a popular considered option is simply because TLS is everywhere. One of the reasons we struggled with it is because TLS is everywhere, and so our developers don't pay attention to it. We have TLS terminated on load balancers, on web application firewalls, on um, API gateways on front end microservices that ignore it on the back end microservice. And so we found challenges keeping that TLS tunnel bound all the way through. 
Um, and then we frequently would see cases where client servers would want to issue tokens to clients, and so that was that was a challenge. And so we we always adopted uh, at T-Mobile the client layer. Now I'll get into client assertions in a minute, but it's actually an OIDC part of the spec that's been there for I think four years already um, on uh, how a client server could as uh, assert its key. All right, so the application layer, the benefit there is the same developers that are responsible for understanding what that ID token is, what the claims are, how to validate them is the same, you know, if they can read a JWT, they can generate a JWT. So application layer really is about the clients generating their own JWTs with every request. Okay, so there are four interconnected pillars here. And unfortunately, you kind of have to understand how each one of these connect to each other. In order to implement application level proof of possession, in order to sign every request, we also rolled out JWTs as access tokens. Well, handy yes, there's a new spec that uh, Vittori is working on over there. Um, I think at IETF next month, they'll be working on that some more. Um, so we switched over to JWT access tokens to <coughs> hold the key statement, right? Um, we also connected to that then, want to issue per client key, right? So we had to roll out client instance keys instead of just client registered keys. And of course, the OIDC spec for client keys. And we're using that um, to set the root of our binding. And so you'll see that in my details as we jump into that. Okay, so here we have a mock environment. Uh, in this case, you have an IDP. We've been moving users for years into FIDO keys. So we now have public keys for users, right? The user's password never has to go across that wire in the clear or even encrypted. The secret never has to go across the wire. So similarly, we're moving all of our clients to keys as well. So when those clients register and onboard, we have a registered key for them. So we'll have a client out there like the SP server in this case. Think of it as one app, one client ID, one registered key pair, key A in our little key locker down there. And now SP server could have thousands of instances, right? SP server may be a web page, in which case every instance of that web page may use crypto libraries to generate their own keys, right? And so in a typical installation, for the first example, the SP server is going to process the token request, right? Nobody sticks the secret in the in the web browser, so SP client initiates the flow, auth code is redirected back to the server. Server then is using the client assertion. And so this is what that token request looks like, the server is making on behalf of the client. In this case, we have now added the client assertion type as JWT and client assertion. And this is in the OIDC spec for how we can get the SP server to prove possession of his registered key without actually passing across the secret across the wire, which is super important as in the four carriers working together don't want to have secrets in four different databases, right? So moving that direction. And here you can see a decoded example of that, of that assertion signed by that registered key A, so that's the proof. And then we can issue an access token. The access token now is issued with the CNF. So the CNF is the confirmation key. So this is the key we've issued this, this access token to. And in this case, key A is the, is, is the key that we've issued it to. Um, I think I missed one right there. We do have an extra header for some legacy clients that may not, um, may not be using client assertions. Um, I'll get back to that. That's actually closer to the DPOP spec. All right, so trying to walk through it in a forward, forward path. Okay, so this now is what we're finding increasingly. Client servers don't want to do the transactions for their clients. They actually want to offload the request. They're willing to do the token request, but they actually want to hand that token to the client so that the client can make the API calls. If you're thinking in a mobile world, I pay for my AWS resources for the SP server, I get the SP client running for free on all my users' phones. And so as much as possible, even for latency and speed and performance, they're trying to issue tokens that can be used from the client themselves. And so what we need to do is get a token 
that instead of being issued to key A, is being issued to key B. But the only key we have in our locker is a registered key A, right? Now there's another form of this, which is more of a delegated binding, where not only the token call, but the user info and any of those resource calls as well wants to be delegated. So in this case, the SP client, think of it as a browser app. So the SP client may load up, initialize, generating with web crypto keys at its own unique pair of uh, secrets, and then requests from the SP server that um, client assertion that it can use for the, both the token as well as all those API calls. And I use user info, I really could be any resource. Um, and so the, the uh, client assertion moves from a basic signature to having a referred binding. So the referred binding now is basically the server key A is telling us that he trusts and wants the token issued to key B. So we've now offloaded the responsibility of verifying client B belongs to server A, right? And so that'll be another piece of the, of the uh, solution we work on in the future. Um, but at this point now, we can issue the access token instead of issuing it to the server key A, we issue it to the client key B, and now the client can go ahead and make all those requests. So everybody stay calm. This is the exciting part. I had to get my obli obligatory meme in there. Justin had, what, 100 slide, 100 memes? <laughs> um, all right, so this is where we look at the DPOP spec. So Daniel Fett from yes.com has been doing some fantastic work trying to capture, uh, in the last six months, a um, draft spec has been come together. Um, you can find it on the IETF site. I have a link to it. I think actually it was earlier in the document was the link. Um, for T-Mobile, we've built a couple of extensions. In addition to the client signing the request, we also have the client signing the entire body of the request. And so what we did is we added the EHTS and the EDTS fields, right? And so this is where a client developer can say, I've specifically set these headers and this body attribute. Perhaps it's a get and they don't need to put the body there, but it could be a post, in which case they should sign the body. Authorization should always be an attribute sign because you always want the client to sign as use of the token. Um, but frequently our developers don't actually have control of the HTTP stack, right? So they're using a standard HTTP library. The library is auto-inserting the um, user agent, the language, the content length and it may arbitrarily reorder those headers as it goes through various proxy layers, load balancers, application firewalls. Um, and so what this does is allows the developer to find the order of these headers that'll be signed. And so as a server receiving this transaction, you can reconstruct those headers in that order, generate that SHA-256, and now you've confirmed not only the client that was given the token is the client that's using the token, but that nobody's meaningfully modified that request in transit as well, right? So even if you go through other microservice layers to proxy requests, things like that, the, uh, the integrity of the entire message can be maintained. Um, and of course, we found pretty fast, don't sign the host header. <laughs> Those change really quickly. They almost always break the signature. Um, the DPOP spec, has a slight variation here. They actually insert a request URI and the client's public key into this assertion. And so they basically can use the same DPOP as a POP signature on API request, and they can also use it on the token request. Now, um, at T-Mobile and the other carriers, we don't, we don't want um, to support client secrets, and so we'll just reuse the client assertion for now. Um, and that way we can extend that signature all the way through a trusted client key. Um, and so this is what a resource request then looks like. Hit an API endpoint, pass your access token as everybody's familiar with. Um, access token has that CNF inside it that you can use to authenticate the XAuth. Now as I mentioned at the beginning, T-Mobile's been looking at this for about three years. So we've got some legacy XAuth headers that are in there. We uh, may or may not go back and look at the uh, DPOP spec has been looking at um, that uh, DPOP as a, as a header field. Um, 
some of the stuff that we found pretty quickly was the same reason we went for an application level binding is the same challenge because we have large and diverse application teams. T-Mobile has more than 4,000 microservices out there, more than 400 of them internet facing. You constantly have teams that are coming in, hiring new vendors, bringing in resources. You know, OAuth is a fairly ubiquitous flow now, but uh, binding isn't. And so finding ways to enforce the enforcement is always tricky, right? So security scanning, looking for these bindings, looking to pass in falsified bindings, confirming the developers are catching it correctly, um, moving things towards API gateways, um, catching things at the border. We also are looking at trying to extend it into the network as well. Um, but the other big one is just making SDKs and going with the standards. So that's one of the reasons why we've been really excited um, to see the DPOP spec coming together, because this is something we've already been working on. And um, uh, it's cool to actually use it as a standard, and then we're not having to retrain our developers every time, because it's, it's, it's something that's already there. Um, Oh, there was, sorry, one more comment I wanted to make there. So um, it takes a lot of steps to validate these tokens, right? I mean, validating a JWT access token alone, does it come from an ISS I trust? Does it have a valid expiry? Does it have a, an, a, an AMR that I'm accepting, an ACR value I'm accepting? Um, does the off time match what I need it to match? Um, does the subject, somebody I recognize, um, and now to add the DPOP on top of that, you know, it's a lot of steps. So just take it out of their out of their hands. But in a SDK layer, they can still get into if they need to. Um, so in summary, um, T-Mobile is already requiring DPOP tokens on all of our new APIs, um, and this has been the case for the last six months already. Um, and so that includes all consumer enterprise partner authenticated flows. If you're a company that wants to talk to T-Mobile, you are signing every one of your requests now, um, whether you've got users in your flow or not. Um, and we are also opening this week, uh, we'll be posting on our open source channel, so we'll be releasing all of our DPOP libraries. Um, so we'll have the first, the first DPOP um, instances available. Um, and then, the other cool topic, we were at IAW and everybody was talking about how do you take this to the next step? So how can you chain multiple microservices together and actually um, see the integrity of a transaction as it goes through its multiple hops? And of course the challenge there is just the body keeps changing as you go through those hops. Um, but more to be seen, we'll be putting all of that work into the DPOP working group. All right, any questions? I realize it was, a deeper dive than a lot of the other talks and uh, APIs. Yeah, right over there. Hi, yeah. Um, are you thinking of um, contributing back the uh, the spec for signing the headers and the body? And if you are, please, can you make the headers case insensitive? And uh, yes, yes. And you know what? That was probably autocorrect. All. Uh, Case no, it's just because we have had real problems with some of the other HTTP signing specs, and yeah, really, really not respecting that. And then, but what, what, about the body? I mean, how, how is there a way to, you know, um, what 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 hashing is used for the body? And you know, does there not need to be another parameter there? Are you using digest header, or or how how do you handle the the body? Um, actually, we define it in the in the JWT signature. In the body of the signature, in this case, we've indicated the algorithm is SHA-256. And so the receiving server knows to take those headers and those order, generate a SHA-256, and it should equal to that EDTS string. But, but yes, we are working with Daniel, who's working on that DPOP spec right now. And so we're feeding back all this, all this content. Um, the EDTS and EHTS are probably going to be optional extensions rather than mandatory components of that spec. But uh, yeah, we're working on that. Yeah. Hey, I remember uh, OAuth, the first version of OAuth when there was a signature uh, involved in that spec, and then OAuth 2 came along. And a lot of people argued that you know the wide adoption of OAuth 2 
uh, was because of its simplicity. So yeah. I'm wondering, what's your opinion on that? And, and do you have any hope or, or, or maybe lessons learned from, from 2006 that will allow these types of uh, standards to be more widely adopted? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. Um, OAuth 1 didn't really get a lot of acceptance because it was complicated for developers who didn't have a lot of experience generating signatures at that time. Um, part of that answer is the SDK approach where we need to make it easier for developers to take an off-the-shelf library and just plug it in. Uh, if you look at somebody like um, you know, AWS and Azure, you know, their APIs require signing and they've been that way for years and nobody, no developer complains about you know, how do I talk to Azure and install, a, you know, make API calls to Azure. They just use the Microsoft SDK and it works. Um, and all those SDKs apply that signatures for them. So that's definitely the approach is underneath the hood, you have to understand how this works, but simplify it so the developers don't. Does that answer your question? All right. Yeah. I, this sounds very similar to HTTP signatures. Is that, is it the same concept just applied to OAuth or? Are there fundamental differences? Um, I think there's a lot of parallels to a lot of technologies here. Yeah, we, we have been moving towards JWT access tokens, so it was just convenient to use a JWT as the, as the proof of possession vehicle. There are other, you know, like TLS, there are other vehicles and the HTTP signatures as well. Yeah. Um, Mike Jones, Microsoft. I just wanted to follow up agreeing with some of your points, particularly OAuth 1 and general purpose request signing uh, are complicated enough and you're signing enough different headers and there's enough choices that developers kept getting it wrong and finding interrupt problems by, for instance, trying to sign the host. Yeah. Which then changed that from under them. And when a signature breaks, you don't get a user-friendly error message. You just get a mismatch. And then you have to sort out, well, why did the signature mismatch? Yes. And it's and really hard. Yeah. And we actually created a bunch of um, not spec compliant, unique HTTP error messages specifically around signatures so that clients would know if it was the access token or the signature that was causing them heartache. But again, developers don't really want to dig into those details. Right. And unlike OAuth 1, we now have JOTs and libraries in every conceivable language so that if we're doing the signatures that way, at least they're pulling off the shelf libraries, as you said. Exactly, that's the goal. Yep. There's a question right here. You have a question? Oh, here, okay, sorry. Oh. I see one over there. You got two minutes, enough time for another one there. Do you have to implement a resource server for DOP on the, the server side? Or? How does it work on the server side? Um, well, um, every API server you have is a resource server of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, now, it may be that not every resource server, let's see, it may be that not every resource server um, decides that it is important enough to need the extra signature. So for instance, you may have a basic, um, you know, how many minutes do I have left this month, right? I'm a telephone company, I've got, you know, how many minutes are on your plan? They're all unlimited, don't worry, the answer is infinite. Um, but uh, as an API server, I may decide, you know what, this particular, because you're not trying to implement a change on the user's account, we kept the JWT access token as a bearer token, because in this case, this API server is using the access token as a bearer token. And we may have a different API endpoint that lets you change your billing plan, in which case we've decided we really want to apply the signatures, and so that API server will then add validation of the X authorization header. Now at a client layer, because they're implementing a standard SDK, Every API call to star.tmobile.com is going to be signed, um, whether or not they actually apply the, the, the servers validating the signature. Um, and as a carrier, we are capable of now issuing DPOP enabled access tokens. Whether or not your service converts those, use those, recasts them into your own tokens, the token you get from the carrier will be DPOP enabled. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
I think we're out of time, right? That was it. We're at, thank so you. we've got a 20 minute break, but thank you so much to Mike Egan for an amazing session.